you live. Uh, these are called Lucy's. Uh, means single items of something that are usually sold in packages, like these crackers. Uh, but because not everyone can afford to buy a whole box, store owners who have a customer base that doesn't necessarily have a lot of money to spend, uh, stores, those store owners will sometimes sell stuff loosely, as in Lucy's. Uh, most of the time when people talk about Lucy's, they mean cigarettes. It is an often illegal but often available way to buy one cigarette at a time instead of buying a whole expensive pack. But it's not always cigarettes. You can also find Lucy aspirin and Lucy eggs and so on. Lucy's can tell us a lot about the local customers, whether it is poor students who are always trying to bust up a six-pack of beer or working families scrounging something for the kids to eat. We do not all approach the counter with the same amount of money at our disposal. But regardless of how much we can afford to buy at any one time, we are all treated the same way by the sales tax. Sales tax doesn't care if you are a janitor with four kids and one precious dollar, or if you are a cardiologist with a second home and lots of dollars. And because of that, the less you make, the greater percentage of your income you pay when you pay the sales tax. If you don't make much money, that sales tax on the egg might be 1% of a day's pay for you. Could probably be more like a thousandth of a percent of the cardiologist's paycheck for the day. A sales tax is therefore among the least populist ways of raising money for government, proportionally speaking. It takes the most from people with the least money and the least from everybody who has more money. Because of that backwards impact, because it's harder on the poor and easier on the rich, you might think a tax like that would be among the most unpopular tax ideas. But in bright red states, in states where Republicans have complete control of the government, that tax all of a sudden is really popular. This month in Louisiana, Republican Governor Bobby Jindal wrote out his agenda for this year. Get rid of the income tax and corporate taxes, where how much you pay depends on how much you make. But do not worry about the billions in lost tax revenue, because Louisiana, to compensate, will jack up the sales tax that everybody has to pay, and that takes such a bigger chunk out of poor people's pocketbooks. When the nonpartisan tax wonks calculate the effect of Governor Jindal's plan, they find that overall taxes will fall for the richest 20% of people in the state, their taxes will go down, but for the remaining 80% of the population, taxes will go up. And the people in all of Louisiana who can least afford a tax hike will get the biggest tax hike. That, that is what Bobby Jindal has in the works for Louisiana. Happy Mardi Gras. Uh, in Kansas, which doesn't have Mardi Gras, except privately, Republican Governor Sam Brownback gets to do more or less what Sam Brownback wants, because Republicans also control the legislature there. Uh, the other day, Governor Brownback announced his agenda for this year, and oh, hey, look, that's familiar, an end to the income tax. Already, Republican tax cuts approved last year have opened up a giant hole in the Kansas budget. Now the governor wants to pay for that with a higher sales tax, and by ending tax breaks that benefit ordinary working families. This is after Kansas Republicans already took away tax breaks for stuff like food, the kind of tax breaks that try to make up for the unfair nature of the sales tax. The nonpartisan tax wonks say they have a worried eye on the plans of Republican governors this year, not just in Kansas and Louisiana, but in Wisconsin and in Ohio and Nebraska. In North Carolina, where Republicans won complete control last year, they're now talking about making the poor pay more. So that's how the political season is opening up this year in the red states. In Washington, D.C., where Republicans are not in charge, where they like to remind everyone that they only control one half of one third of the federal government, Republicans have been sounding the sad trombone this past week. Woe is them, or woe are them, I guess. We're expecting here uh, over the next uh, 22 months uh, to uh, be the, the focus of this administration as they attempt uh, to annihilate uh, the Republican Party. And let me just tell you, I do believe that is their goal, uh, to just uh, shove us into the dustbin of history. He needs to delegitimize the Republican Party and House Republicans in particular. The president will bait us. He will portray us as cruel and unyielding. We can't get rattled. We won't play the villain in his morality plays. Democrats are not organized enough to have their talking points be this evident, but when Republicans do it, it's kind of obvious, right? This is the new Republican leadership talking point. President Obama is mean, and Republicans are helpless before his meanness in Washington. But you know what? Re Republicans have complete control of government in 24 states, which is a lot. And where they do have control, they're not blaming Obama, right? Look what they're doing in governance.
They're having the rich pay less, and they're having the poor pay more. This is not what they're marketing to the nation, but this is what they are doing when they are handed the reins of government. Economist Paul Krugman wrote about this deja news in his latest column. What we're seeing now, he says, is open, explicit, reverse Robin Hoodism, taking from ordinary families and giving to the rich. Even as Republicans look for a way to sound more sympathetic and less extreme, their actual policies are taking another sharp right turn. Why is this happening? In particular, why is it happening now, just after an election in which the Republican Party paid a price for its anti-populist stand? Good question. And it's the distance between what the Beltway writes down when the Republicans talk about themselves versus what Republicans actually do where they are in charge. It's a very good question. Paul Krugman himself is here for the interview. Straight ahead. Noon with the clash of two statements. One delivered by a man who's enjoying some of the highest approval ratings of his career. The other delivered by a third-rate actor who's trying desperately to put a new face on some tired old policies. The subject, a so-called sequester that will trigger a trillion dollars in spending cuts in less than four weeks. But we've also seen the effects that political dysfunction can have on our economic progress. That, of course, was the president seeking to protect a fragile recovery from falling back into recession if the sequester is allowed to occur. And then there was Speaker Boehner. The House, uh, on two occasions, has passed a plan uh, to replace the sequester. It's time for the Senate Democrats uh, to do their work. It's time for the president. Uh, to offer his idea. It's hardly surprising that the speaker sounds bored by the very words coming from his very own mouth because it is the self-same rhetoric that Republicans have been spouting for ages. The president's uh, budget is late again. It is a bill that frankly says to the president, you know, please join us in doing your job. And he's missed the deadline for the five times. And the president, we hope he takes off his Superman cape and sends up a serious plan. Sorry, but uh, back at the White House, the president was offering yet another simple explanation for why indiscriminate cuts without any additional revenues makes no sense at all. We can't just cut our way to prosperity. Deep, indiscriminate cuts to things like education and training, energy and national security will cost us jobs. Of course, the architect for the Republican position on the economy has been Congressman Paul Ryan, who chairs the House Budget Committee. And just as Mr. Ryan has problems recalling his exact marathon time, so he appears to have real problems with who was responsible for the sequester in the first place. We think these sequesters will happen because the Democrats have opposed our efforts to replace those cuts with others, and they've offered no alternatives. Mm. And while the Republican approach to the fast-approaching sequester leads them to rewrite history and ignore the potential for economic disaster, Mr. Ryan's friend and colleague, House Majority Leader Eric Cantor, was also out delivering his own version of Republican revisionism. Our House Republican majority stands ready for the president and his party to join us in actually tackling the big problems facing this country. That was Mr. Eric Cantor 6.0. Let's turn to Representative Keith Ellison, Democrat from the state of Minnesota, and to my colleague Joy Reid, who's managing editor of thegrio.com. Congressman, it, it seems to me, sir, that we have a major collision today. On the one hand, we have Speaker Boehner and his boys out there pushing a bill to balance the budget on the backs of the poor. And now on the other hand, we've got a bill that you are co-sponsoring, the Balancing Act, I believe it's called, that yes. would close upper income tax loopholes and keep nearly 300,000 teachers at work and add one million jobs to the economy. Have I got that right, sir? You've got it right. And uh, all we do is close loopholes on the fossil fuel industry, on the yacht owners and the plane owners. Uh, we close loopholes on carried interests. Loopholes that should be closed in any budget environment, we close those and then we arrive at a place where we have balance between the cuts that we've already seen, 1.7 trillion, uh, and revenue increases. And then through changes in uh, the reductions and efficiencies in the uh, Pentagon budget, we put 300 uh, billion into jobs, which saves teachers, which invests in school infrastructure, uh, and which uh, helps promote work and, uh, and, and help small businesses 
key people on who are who, uh, who want to work. But so it's a great idea. But Congressman, uh, Mr. Ryan and Mr. McConnell at the beginning of this year say, said quite clearly the revenues issue is now closed, it's off the table, there are no more discussions on revenues. So they would rather uh, cut home heating oil for seniors. Yes. They'd rather cut women and infants and children. Yes. Food programs. Yes. They'd rather cut things like that than yes. ask some rich people for a little bit more money. What about I transportation services for the disabled? What about oh, Meals yes. on Wheels? What about right. Head Start program? That right. is what they'd like to cut. This is correct. That, yeah. And so uh, it's, it's brutal. It's cruel. And uh, it will cause layoffs. And we will see... Uh, economic growth decline uh, and and they're willing to do all this just to protect the wealthiest few and I think that's a moral outrage I think Americans of all stripes ought to stand up and say no uh, and this is why the Progressive Caucus members have offered the balancing act because you know there is a way forward there is a way to address budgetary uh, and deficit issues and invest in our economy and there's a way to protect people who are most vulnerable and to ask people who've been so blessed to be members of this society to just pony up a little bit more. It's not going to stop them from getting yachts and planes and <laughs> no. all kinds of goodies like that. They'll still have that stuff. I'm sure that's right, sir. But kids will have meals. Yes, and indeed. And seniors will have warm houses to live in. Yes. Joy, um, I seem to recall that this issue of closing loopholes mm -hmm and reducing deductions was suggested by some Republicans not so long ago. Take a listen. We propose to close those special interest loopholes. Let's get rid of these special interest loopholes and deductions, plug loopholes, lower everybody's tax rates, get rid of special interest loopholes, plug these loopholes. So for Mr. Ryan, plugging loopholes is great when Mitt Romney proposes as an idea, but as soon as the president does, it's off the table. First of all, who's Mitt Romney? Sorry, <laughs> forgive me. Oh, right, that guy. I remember yeah. him. No, you're exactly right. And it, it, what's interesting, too, is that and you were getting to it in your intro. The sequester, we should all remember, was the ransom <laughs> that Republicans in the House demanded of the White House in order to raise right. the debt ceiling in 2011. But That's they the now say it was the president <laughs> who's responsible. Exactly. Yes. They voted. And don't forget, Paul Ryan runs a marathon in less than one hour. I thought it was like 20 minutes. Like Indeed. He's Superman. It, it, this is what they wanted. It's of course, Congressman, here's another apparent contradiction that you might like to clear up for us. On the one hand, you've got Eric Cantor out there today giving a speech on making life work. He sounds like Tony Robbins or something. He's trying to sell yet another iteration of the Republican Party, but when you strip away the soft smile and the cadence, he'd happily, he'd happily slash every one of those programs that you just went through, wouldn't he? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Eric Cantor despite all of the, uh, the the covering and the veneer, is definitely uh, proposing budgets that are hostile to middle and low income people, and uh, particularly to vulnerable people. But not only that, these, you know, programs like, uh, like SNAP, like, uh, uh, like food stamps, actually uh, give people money that they can spend at the store, which allows the store to hire people. So eventually the programs they cut won't just hurt the people who benefit directly, but the people who are employed indirectly by these programs, which is literally millions of people. And so, I mean, it's really bad economic policy. No model of economic uh, uh, understanding would support what they're doing except for some sort of like, um, I don't know, some sort of uh, the, the Grinch stole Christmas kind of uh, philosophy. <laughs> Joy, can you, can you help me understand Eric Cantor Extreme Makeover Edition? Who is this man? Because on the day he gives this speech, Earlier in the day, he stands up with Speaker Boehner and says, why isn't the president slashing the budget to pieces? <laughs> exactly. Well, it's called his district is becoming more purple. I think Eric Cantor is worried about his own political future, and that's where he's trying to make over the Republican Party. And look, let's face it, the Republican Party, as Representative Ellison just said, they really do want to cut food stamps, which, by the way, benefits Kraft Foods and Walmart and farmers, as well as the poor. Let's right. keep it real. Right? I yes. think that Kraft is right. one of the biggest single company beneficiary, as well as Walmart. But um, they really want 
want to cut these programs for the poor. It's their ideological want to do that. But number one, they weren't foresighted. They didn't have enough foresight to get that into the sequester. They exempted things like Medicaid and Medicare and Social Security from the sequester. And now they are begging and dying for the president to propose draconian cuts to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid so they don't have to have their fingerprints on it, just as they want That's all right. of these draconian cuts to go through without people like Eric Cantor in increasingly purple districts to have to pay a political price. Absolute charade and farrago. Congressman Keith Ellison, Joy Reid, thank you both so much.